book of Daniel. We'll continue our study through this book. We've entitled it Being Bold in Babylon. And uh, many of you are familiar with the book of Daniel. And uh, you're familiar with the context. And uh, in case you're not, the context is Jerusalem. Uh, Judah has uh, been so idolatrous. They have blasphemed against God for so long. They have served false gods. They've put um, idols in, even in the house of God. And, uh, and God has judged them and Babylon has come and besieged them and uh, made three sieges. They've went in and they've taken people hostage. They've torn down the temple. They've broke it up. They've taken all the gold and all the vessels and all of the treasure and they've taken all of that out. And they've taken um, most of the Hebrews captive and, uh, and they will be in captivity there in Babylon for 70 years. That is the context of the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel stands up for God. He is a prophet. He is a, uh, a preacher. He tells visions and he foretells the future. Maybe you remember the handwriting on the wall passage where Daniel interprets what God had said. And, uh, and Daniel is a preacher during the, t- the captivity in Babylon. And, uh, and so we've entitled this series, Being Bold in Babylon. And I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 3 tonight. Daniel chapter 3. This is the well-known story of the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. And uh, you've probably heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian names that uh, they were given. Their original names, their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Uh, but this is the passage where they are thrown into the fiery furnace. Raise your hand if you've heard that before, or read that text before, probably heard many messages out of it. And um, I'm sad to say we're probably not going to get to the furnace tonight. Um, we are probably just going to focus on Nebuchadnezzar once again. We talked about him Sunday night, and we'll, uh, we'll look at him again. But uh, Daniel chapter 3, if you have that, would you stand with us and we'll read some scripture. Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So he's built this, uh, this massive uh, statue, this massive image, and, uh, and they're having a dedication ceremony. They're having a big church service for it, a big ceremony service, and he wants all the people in his realm to be there. In verse number 3, Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and say the next word, Worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar The king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And for a little bit tonight, I want to preach to you on the Nebuchadnezzar Baptist Church. The Nebuchadnezzar Baptist Church. Pray one more time with me and for me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word of God. And uh, Lord, it is always right, and it is always what we need. Lord, no matter what end of the spectrum we may find ourselves, whether we are uh, at the at the height of our Christian life, as right with God as we've ever been, there is Scripture to correct us and help us. If we are dragging the bottom and we are at a low point spiritually, there is Scripture to correct us and help us. If we're mediocre and lukewarm and just apathetic and just somewhere in between. There is always scripture to correct us and help us. As the book of James described it, it is a mirror that we can look in and behold ourselves. 
And uh, Lord, I'm thankful that this Bible is always there to show us what we are and what we need. And Lord, I pray tonight as we look into it that you will give us eyes to see that we may see ourselves. I pray you give us ears to hear that we may, that we may hear and perceive what we are guilty of. Lord, I pray you help us tonight. Give me grace. Lord, I, as I preach this message, I do, I do beg you for an ornament of grace upon my head. I, I want to preach this message with the right attitude, with the right spirit, and uh, with the right amount of humility. And so, God, I pray you help us tonight. I want to be a blessing to our church. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. In chapter 1, if you'll recall, they are, they've taken these princes and these these goodly young people, and they've put them in the king's college to teach them the tongue of the Chaldeans and the, the learning of the Chaldeans so that they can work as Chaldean people, so they can serve the, the king. And so chapter 1 tells us about the wisdom of Babylon. The wisdom of Babylon. They, they want the Hebrews to think like them and talk like them and work like them. They, they just want them to be like them. They, they want them to assimilate to their to their environment and be like them. And we, we've, we uh, preached about that for a, for a few weeks, about how Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael stood up against that and said that they would not defile themselves and, and how they, they stood up for that. And, and then they wound up being ten times better than all the rest. But, but Daniel chapter 1 is about the wisdom of Babylon. Then if you'll recall in chapter number 2, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. He kept having this this dream of this giant image that uh, was made of gold and silver, brass and iron and clay and how this massive stone cut without hands came out of the heavens and, and destroyed that thing. And, and, and he had this awful dream and nobody could interpret it and he, he had forgotten it. He even said, the thing is gone from me. And he kept asking his astrologers and his Chaldeans and his magicians to tell him his dream and interpret it and none of them could. And they said... that. Only, only a God could do that. And, and so in chapter 2, we see the weakness of Babylon. The weakness of Babylon. If you'll remember how chapter 2 goes, when no Babylonian could help the king and could get this vision back from God, Daniel could. And uh, one of God's people could. And, and what I see in that is I see in chapter 1, they, they don't want the God's people to be like God's people. They want them to be like them, but... Then they find out that they really need God's people to really be like God's people because they're too weak and they do need spiritual leadership and they need somebody that can talk to God and they need somebody that can get a prayer answered and they need somebody that can, somebody help me tonight. And can I say that's what the world does still today? They don't want us to be like us. They want to mock us and change us and want us to assimilate and be just like them. But as soon as something comes up that they don't have the spiritual wherewithal to handle, what do they do? They come running into the church and say, oh, pray for us and pray for this and, and come to this funeral and come to this hospital and do that and do that. We need somebody to get a hold of God. And we see the weakness of, of Babylon. We see the weakness of Babylon. And, and I'm not, and, 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 and please don't, don't, don't judge me. I'm not, I, I, I'm not necessarily pitching too big of a fit. Daniel did pray for Babylon. He did pray for Nebuchadnezzar and Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah did earnestly covet together and pray that God would tell Daniel what that king needed to hear. And, and, and so when they do come and they say, we need you to help us with this funeral, we need you to pray for this or fix our marriage or our kids or our mess, we do try to be there for them. We do try to help because they are weak and they need somebody that can talk to God. And so we see the weakness of Babylon. But in chapter 3, we find the worship of Babylon. The worship of Babylon. Now in chapter 2, what we found was how we could relate to Nebuchadnezzar because God had said something to him multiple times. He had this dream over and over again and he, and he kept losing it. And, and, he, and he couldn't, he had a supernatural need and no one around him could help him and uh, he needed a prayer answered, and he couldn't get it answered, and his, his closest friends couldn't get it answered. And, and, and we, so we can kind of relate to that because it's a scary thing to know you need to hear from God and can't. And we talked about the decision that Nebuchadnezzar made. He decided he was going to destroy all of the wise men in Babylon, the Chaldeans, the magicians, the astrologers, even, the, the three, even all the Hebrews. He was going to destroy them as well. 
And he made a very bad decision uh, when he could not get a hold of God. When he could not get God's mind on something, he made a very bad decision. And we said we could relate to that. And, uh, and I do hate to keep finding things we can relate to Nebuchadnezzar on. But as I read Daniel chapter 3, I can't help but find many ways that we do relate to Nebuchadnezzar. And I can't help but see how many times uh, churches and preachers act the exact way that Nebuchadnezzar is acting here in Daniel chapter 3. It is a, it is a worship service... And what has happened, the text you have read, is Nebuchadnezzar has built a, a massive image. They, they tell me in verse 1 that the, the, the three score cubits, the 60 cubits, and that would equal out to about 90 feet. And uh, there's a lot of debate on how big a cubit is in the Bible because a cubit is the span of your hand. And there's much debate on how big people were then. And so we don't know exactly how big it was, but we can go on, on a very conservative assumption that a cubit is the span of your hand. And, and this, uh, or whatever, maybe I'm going to get my terminology mixed up, but they say that this thing was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. We do see that it is 60 feet or 60 cubits high, and it is 6 cubits wide. And when we read verse number 5, there are 6 different instruments, and so we can clearly see the number of the beast there, 6, 6, 6. And, uh, and he has built this massive uh, obelisk, this big, tall tower. And uh, those are not hard to find in history. They're not hard to find today. Mexico has a large one. Germany has a large one called the, the Victor's Column. has a big bronze angel on the top of it. Russia has one in the center of their, one of their big towns. Europe has one. Even our great nation has uh, one there in Washington, D.C. It's called the Washington Monument. And uh, by the way, that thing is, uh, is uh, 666 feet tall. What I've been told, and uh, I've never measured it, so I don't know. But that's just what I was—that's just what I read on the internet. And if it's on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> but there are these giant idols, these giant obelisks. You can find them all over the place. But this one was—this one's a little bit different because this one's made out of gold, like the whole thing. There has been a lot of time passed between Daniel 2 and Daniel 3, and by this time Nebuchadnezzar has literally conquered the world. And uh, he has a world empire at this time, and, and uh, the amount of gold that he had access to would have been uh, just unbelievable, almost King Solomon-like. And there's a reason why there's not a shred of this thing left, because it was built out of currency, it was built out of money, it was built out of gold. And so as Babylon was conquered, that thing was taken and broken down, melted down, and the gold was taken. But this was a giant golden obelisk or, or, or statue figure. And he has built this thing, and, and uh, he, his ego is just unbelievably huge. Uh, now, in J Daniel chapter 2, when he has this vision, the vision was of this statue that had a head of gold. And in verse 38, Daniel tells him that thou art this head of gold. In Daniel chapter 3, as Daniel tells him the vision, he says, Thou, O king, saw and beheld a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold. He said, Thou art this head of gold. And now Nebuchadnezzar has taken uh, this, and he has built a giant statue or a giant uh, uh, a figure, a form, sometime, uh, a lot, many think it was a, a, a bust of himself that we have no way of knowing. Nonetheless, he did want everyone to come and worship it. And uh, his ego is just exalted uh, above measure. And he's not only built a big ego, he's built a massive empire. In verse number 2, as he, as he summons all the governors and princes and captains and judges and treasurers and counselors and sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces to come... That's all the people from his empire. That's all the, the, uh, all the rulers and everyone in charge over in his empire. He wants them all to come. And, and later on in verse number 4, as that herald begins to cry to them, he says, O people, nations, and languages, 
Oh, people, nations, and languages, and all these people, they all had to come, and they all had to bow to Nebuchadnezzar, and he has built an empire that is really all about Nebuchadnezzar, and is all about himself, and he's built a massive empire. And then he builds himself some pretty big enemies. In verse number 6, he says, Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So if you're not worshiping me, then I hate you and I'm going to burn you to death. Now there's a couple of parallels that we can find throughout the rest of Scripture. Number one, in Revelation chapter 13, the beast, the Antichrist, this, this will happen again. This, this will happen again, Revelation chapter 13. And one of the things that, st- that stands out to me and strikes me as very odd and very anti-Christ and anti-God is that the punishment for not worshiping Nebuchadnezzar and worshiping Nebuchadnezzar's image was being cast into the fire. And the, that is the exact punishment of rejecting God is being cast into hell fire. And this is, is this, this is just a very blasphemous thing. And I know you're, I know you're probably thinking, well, how in the world does the church relate to Nebuchadnezzar and this ego and this empire and this, these enemies that he's made? Well, I can't help but think in Daniel 2 as he's been given a vision from God and it's all about a great image. And the next time we find Nebuchadnezzar in Scripture, he's built a great image. And he's made it out of gold. And he wants everyone to bow down to it. And what I'm seeing is that Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar, received a vision from God, but he has done something with that vision that God never intended him to do. He has misused the revelation. All of this happened because God spoke to him. God showed him something. And when it entered into the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, it went straight to his head. God showed him something spectacular, something that he didn't show anyone else. Only Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel saw those, saw that vision, saw that image, and saw that stone. Only those two men saw that. And God revealed that to Nebuchadnezzar, and it went straight to his head. It built this unbelievable unbelievable ego. He built a massive empire and he made enemies. If you're not going to worship me, then I, then, then I am completely against you so much that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you into the fire. And all because he misused the revelation that God has given him. And beloved, I can't help but think in my mind of how many churches and how many preachers have been given a great revelation from God and then they misuse that revelation or they misuse that anointing, they misuse that power, they misuse that great opportunity and they make it all about themselves. And it puffs up this giant ego and and then they make an empire that is all about them and it's all about their name and, and it's all about their property and their building and their efforts and it's all about them. And then they begin to make enemies because if you're not for us and you're not in my camp or you're not doing it how I'm doing it, then you're probably not even saved. You're probably going to go to the fire. All because they've misused what God's given them. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, this is the last time God spoke to him, and he gave him this wonderful revelation, and it went straight to his head. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7, as Paul is talking about all the revelations God gave him, he said, because of the abundance of revelation, I was given a thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. He said, God had to, God had to send the messenger of Satan to buffet me to keep me from becoming a Nebuchadnezzar. To keep me from having this giant ego. To to keep me from building this massive Pauline empire that's all about Paul. And to keep me from making enemies with people. Nebuchadnezzar received a vision from God and it went straight to his head. And I'm afraid that if God answered the prayers that many churches have been praying, it'd go straight to their head. If God answered the prayer of many preachers, it would go straight to their head. If he did send a great revival, it'd be all about us. 
It'd be all about our church. It'd be all about our, what happened at our place and how hard we prayed. And it'd be all about us, all about our ego. And, and we'd build this empire. And, and then if you were against us and didn't like us, then we'd just, you'd be our enemy. And I know some of you haven't been around a lot of different places and you haven't seen a lot of different churches, but can I tell you, this happens all the time. All the time. There are churches that, that pray against other churches that can't stand other churches that think the whole church is not even saved. There are preachers that think other preachers are not saved and go into the fire. There are preachers that are enemies against other preachers. There are Baptists that can't talk to other Baptists. All because God has blessed somebody and then it becomes all about them and goes straight to their head. Now, Calvary Baptist Church, can God trust us with revelation? Or if he blesses us like we all want him to, is it all going to just go to our head? I mean, if Brother Bo, if God poured out a great revival on this place and we started seeing souls saved and we started having ministries all over the place and just God just started blessing us and magnifying us, I wonder if it'd go to our head. And I wonder if maybe that's why he keeps some places 70% empty. Because he knows if he blesses us and gives us something great, it's just going to go right to our ego. And we'll build an empire that will be all about us. And then we'll make other people our enemies that have no business being our enemies. Can God trust us with a revelation? Can God trust us with revival? Can God trust us with this blessing, with this, with this foreknowledge and with this thought? Can God trust us? I mean, you, you see the difference as, look, as Daniel receives the interpretation of the dream in Daniel 2, in verse number 30. He says, As for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. He said, It's not because of any wisdom that I have. I am not, I'm not wiser than any other living. Well, I'm a man, and I'm going to say that Daniel probably was wiser than all the others. I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that, Brother Stephen. Daniel was wiser. He was wiser than Nebuchadnezzar. He's wiser than every one of them uh, bunch of heathen, pagan Chaldeans and magicians and astrologers. Daniel was wiser. But in Daniel's mind, he wasn't wiser because Daniel was humble. So God gave him the revelation to give to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar lost it. It didn't go to Daniel's head. You remember the story or the, the, the parable of the talents. He gave five to one and two to one and then one to another. The one he gave five doubled them. The one he gave two doubled them. But the one he gave one didn't do anything with it. And I believe God knew he wasn't going to do anything with it, and God's not a bad steward. So he doesn't put out a bunch on somebody he, doesn't, he can't trust. And I can't help but see how many... How many churches, how many preachers have been given great revelation and great opportunity, but they've turned it into their own empire, and it's all about them. It's all about their name. So we can relate to him in his misuse of revelation. Well, you know how the text goes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as, as the world knows them, they will not bow to this great image. Now remember, this is the dedication service. So this is not an every week thing. All right? This is one big ceremony. This is one big event. He's got this amazing uh, orchestra from all, different, all these instruments from different parts of the world, and he's imported these people and brought these musicians in. And I mean, this is going to be a big, big deal, politically speaking, and, and uh, this is a one-time event. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won't even do it once. They won't bow one time. And I say amen to that. I say amen to that. They won't make one exception. They will not bow to a false god, not even one time. And they won't bow. In verse number 13, as word has come to Nebuchadnezzar, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, 
O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, with psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast in the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Man, that's so much I want to preach right there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 19, Then was Nebuchadnezzar, say the next three words, full of fury. We can relate to Nebuchadnezzar not only in his misuse of revelation, but we can relate to Nebuchadnezzar in his madness. His madness. These three men would not worship the way he wanted them to worship. And Nebuchadnezzar is mad about it. He is in a rage and full of fury over worship. I mean, he's losing his mind over worship. And can I say I may have been guilty a time or two of falling into a rage and fury while preaching about worship. In verse 19, he was full of fury and the form of his visage was changed. I've been in services and I've seen men, their whole countenance change. And they fall into a fit of rage over worship. Now let me say, I think worship in the house of God ought to be clean. I think it ought to be pure. I think it ought to be holy. I think it ought not be man-centered. I think it ought not be focused on an individual. I think it ought to be all about God. And I think it ought to be pure. And I think it ought to be holy. And I think a lot of what goes on in a lot of churches today is nothing less than a, either a rock show or just a toned-down country music show. And I'm against a lot of those things. That is why our music here is not like that. Our music here is clean. Our music here is, is not fleshly. It is not carnal. It is, it, it is skillful. It is beautiful. And it is Christ-honoring. And so I am against, I am against false worship. I am, I am against all of those things. But you can be against something and not be fuel, full of fury and rage. Contrast Nebuchadnezzar and the, these three Hebrews. How calm and, and how held together they are. They said, we're not careful to answer thee. And they said, if, if God wants to, he can deliver us. If not, oh well. I mean, they're not, they're, not, they're not full of fury. They're not screaming. They're not losing their mind. They're not changing and before everybody and just losing it. Oh, but how many times have we been in service and the preacher just loses it? And what do we think? Oh, man, he's getting it. How many angry churches do we know? That that's kind of one of the common threads is they're just angry at all the liberals. They're just all the time fussing about the contemporary and all the time fussing about the this and all the time mad about how other people worship or how they don't worship. I've been guilty of that. I've been real guilty of getting mad about people not worshiping. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar's doing. He's mad that they won't worship the God he wants them to worship. And I've been guilty, Brother Stephen, of getting mad of, at, at people even in this room for not worshiping the God I'm trying to provoke them to worship. I mean, if I can just be that honest. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. All right, King James. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It's in the Bible. It's always been true. And how many churches spend all their time being mad about worship? Let it not be so here. Let it not be so here that we're mad at the way other people 
do it or don't do it. Let it not be so here that, that we, we spend all our time being in a rage and just eat up with anger about the way people worship. And again, I, and, and I want to say again, I, I want to stand next to uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm with you. Don't bow down to a false god. Worship ought to be towards God and it ought to be to, done in a godly way. 100% agree with that. 100% agree with that. It ought to be pure and it ought to be clean. Be ye angry and sin not. That's also in the Word of God. And Nebuchadnezzar, this is the third time we found him just full of fury. He got full of fury when his wise men couldn't interpret his dream. He got full of fury when he was uh, uh, met with these three Hebrews that wouldn't bow. And then when they refused, he was full of fury again. The man is marked by anger. He's, his leadership, Brother Stephen, is marked by rage. And how just how terrifying he becomes. I don't, I don't want to be that kind of leader. Let me say this. I don't want to be that kind of father. And I don't want to be that kind of husband. I don't want to be that kind of pastor. I know, I'm telling you, I don't like finding ways I can relate to Nebuchadnezzar, but we can relate to his madness. Lastly, I want you to see this. In verse number 19, he was so mad, therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. So he heats this furnace up. He's so mad. It's already a fiery furnace, but now he wants it seven times hotter. And in verse 20, he commanded his most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. So he gets his best soldiers, his strongest, best warriors to come in just to throw these men in the fire. And these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, verse 22, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew... Those men, what men? His most mighty men. It slew his most mighty men. It slew the best soldiers that he had. It killed them. And so we can relate to Nebuchadnezzar and the mismanaging of our mighty men. The mismanaging of our mighty men, that's number three. He has got caught up in a rage... And literally, his best soldiers are now burned up. They're burned out. Because their leader had his urgent, exceeding hot fit of rage, out of balance, had no control over himself, and he heated this thing up, went way overboard. I mean, a fire is a fire. All right, there's no cold fire. And he goes overboard with something and it burns, burns his best men. How many good men have churches just abused to the point of burnout? Gone overboard. Uh, these men's death is the king's fault. I uh, did the blood of these, these most mighty men, oh, that's on Nebuchadnezzar. So, Brother Stephen, next time they go to war and they go to lean on Brother so-and-so, oh, he's dead. He's burned up. He's gone. Why? Nebuchadnezzar mismanaged his mighty man. He mismanaged. I mean, look, these three men are tied up. Uh, and all their clothes and all of their Middle Eastern garb, they're, they're, they're bound up. Uh, there's nothing they can really do. You don't need the biggest, baddest soldier you got. But this king is so foolish and so hot-headed and so out of balance, now he's mismanaged the best men he had. 
And the nation is going to suffer for it next time they go to war. And it's not long Babylon falls. Darius comes in with the Medes, and uh, it don't end well. And I wonder if his most mighty men, his best fighters, his strongest, most skilled soldiers had burned up in this fiery furnace fiasco. I don't know how many great, great Christians we've watched just burn up over in many different churches over the years. And I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's because of the mismanagement of mighty men. The church getting so out of balance, putting all the emphasis on one thing, I know, now, I don't want you to get uneasy here, but I'm, I'm a King James Bible believer. And what that means is I believe the King James is God's perfect, inspired, preserved word. I believe that. But I know churches that I, I, mean, that I go preach in, that they, that's all they want to do is fight about that. And you know what I've watched it do? I've watched it burn some people. Watched it burn them up. I know churches that, uh, that, that I mean, that I go and, and that I have preached for and preached in. And, I mean, I'm not, I'm not bashing the men. I'm, it's not what I'm, I'm not bashing the churches. I'm trying to help ours. Is that okay? And they've put all the emphasis on, on maybe just soul winning. Soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. And every message is all about soul winning. And is soul winning right? Well, of course it is. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Of course it is. It's the Great Commission. Of course. It's burned them out. I wonder, and, and I've seen churches that all they want to do is preach about prophecy. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. Revelation, 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 revelation. It's the only book they read. It's the only book they preach from. It's all they want to talk about. The problem is prophecy doesn't help you be a better wife. Prophecy doesn't help you be a better husband. It doesn't help you be a better prayer warrior. It doesn't help you be a better Christian. It doesn't help you be a better preacher. It doesn't help. And it burns out. And I don't want to get out of balance and burn some of our mighty men. And we've got some mighty men. Brother William is not here. He's at home sick. He don't feel mighty right now, but... Brother William is a mighty man. He's a mighty man. Brother Derek is a mighty man. Brother Derek is reliable. I can count on Brother Derek, and he helps me. And a lot of he does a lot of things around here, and he helps us. He's a mighty man. But we got two of our deacons, Brother Stephen, and Brother James, mighty men that pray and know God. We've got some mighty men, and I don't want to burn them out. I don't want to burn them out, Brother Bo. I don't want to. I don't want to mismanage them and in five years they just be out because they just depleted. And then in five years we can't, we're not, we're, we're not locked arms anymore. I don't, I don't want to see that happen. I, I don't want to mismanage the mighty men and, or even the mighty women. I don't want to mismanage anything mighty in our church and then abuse it. And then in three or four years they're just burned out. The church can relate to mismanaging its mighty men. I'm thinking of a church right now that I've preached in. Sitting on the pews, men that have been to college twice, secular college and then Bible college, and then they just sit. And they're not allowed to teach a Sunday school class. They're not allowed to preach a sermon on Wednesday night when the preacher's out of town. Literally, he'll just call somebody. I mean, that's why I was there. He was out of town, called somebody, brought him in. He won't let none of his men preach. And he's got like preachers, like, like 10 preachers, trained, ready to go. And they've all burned out. Like when Brother Bo preached a couple of Sunday nights ago, man, that was a blessing. If you weren't here, you missed it. Hide and seek. If it's on YouTube, go listen to it. It was a blessing. Brother Stephen, he'll be preaching. Into the week or two, 
Brother William, he preaches on, on uh, the first uh, Sunday night. Well, they, they take turns, but and I don't want to I don't want to misuse or mismanage our mighty men and burn them out out of out of my own personal agenda. That's what this is. This is this is Nebuchadnezzar is head hunting. I'm almost done. I know y'all have been finished for a long time. I'm almost finished. Nebuchadnezzar is head hunting something. He has a personal axe to grind. And he's roping in his, 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 his men, and it, and it burns them up. You know what's interesting? This is so interesting. As Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fiery furnace, and y'all know that he sees four men walking. And, and in verse 26, it says that Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. He went right where they did. They died, and he didn't. Now, logic will tell us that it probably cooled down by then. And it may, not have, it may not have been as hot as it was. But the point that I see is that Nebuchadnezzar stood exactly where they stood, and it didn't kill him, but it did kill them. It's kind of like you can drive your car, but if your kid got in the driver's seat, it'd kill him. It'd kill him. It's too much for them. It's, it, it's too much. Oh, me and Mason were in the boat yesterday, and he was trying to work the trolling motor, but his, his foot's not big enough to move the pedal and hit the trigger at the same time. And if I just got in the back and just said, all right, go for it, I mean, we'd probably drown. Wreck the boat. It's too much for him. And I think sometimes... The church is guilty at mismanaging the mighty men and putting them in a spot they're not ready for. Just because the king's ready, just because the leader's ready, doesn't mean that that man's ready or that. Does that make sense? The point is, he's mismanaged his mighty men and he's burned his best soldiers for nothing over a personal axe to grind. I don't ever want to bring my personal axes to the pulpit, I don't want to bring my personal anger towards something else and then and throw it on you. And I don't want our church to even have axes to grind. It's the Nebuchadnezzar Baptist Church. They misuse the revelation, make it all about themselves. They mad all the time about worship and, and mismanage the mighty men. It's the Nebuchadnezzar Baptist Church. Well, I hope that was a help in some way to you tonight. Be humble, church. Be humble. We pray we want God to do something great, but if He does, is it, is it all going to be about us? It's kind of like, oh, I had a vision, I went to heaven, so now I made a movie and now I'm a millionaire. I don't think so. Oh, I went to hell, and now I wrote this book and made this movie and now I'm real written. I don't think so. I don't think God gave you a revelation. Can God trust us? Can He give us something? Can He answer our prayer and it not go to our heads? I hope so. I hope so. And let's stand up.